Hi, Micah. Hey, Bob. How's it going? I can't complain. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Okay. Well, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show on Mania of Life TV. You are Micah Redding, mm -hmm. and you are, I believe, our first Christian transhumanist. Nice. nice. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Proud to, proud to be here. Bearing the, bearing the flag, waving the flag. Um, so uh, you are executive director of the Christian Transhumanist Association, something that some people may not have realized existed. How long has it existed? Um, we've been going for about three years now. Uh, we, um, we kind of organized out of, out of um, a, a community, a, a small community of, of people and discussions um, going back several, several years prior to that. And uh, we kind of went public um, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've just been kind of a, in a slow process of kind of getting our, our, um, uh, getting our feet wet, getting, uh, getting an understanding of how to run an association like this and what ways we can be most helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, I assume, before we get into the Christian transhumanism part, and what exactly that kind of melding of two things means. Um, just in case there are people who aren't uh, very familiar with the term transhumanism, why don't you tell us what, what you think of that as meaning? Sure, yeah. So at the most basic level, I think, of transhumanism as a philosophy, um, and it's a philosophy that suggests we can and we should um, use science and technology to uh, make the world better. Um, and that can include the human condition, that can include pretty much everything about the way the world operates, the way we live in the world. And it's that last part um, where we don't kind of start with any preconceived limits, uh, any preconceived um, uh, blueprint or something like that, that really kind of makes it transhumanism and um, makes it distinctive. Okay. Now, I had thought of uh, transhumanism as, I, I guess I had had a couple of associations with it. <clears throat> One is, you know, pretty sunny view of the future and of what technology can do for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but also this idea of uh, kind of transcending the constraints we associate with being a human, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, fairly accurate. The um, it, Transhumanism is not necessarily... Um, uh, certainly not a simplistic optimism. It's it's a dynamic optimism that sh says you know we should we should do something uh, to move towards things uh, being better. And it yeah it would look at uh, transcending what we currently think of as the human condition uh, in terms of like the limits of of disease, um, our mobility, you know the b living in a gravity well, things like that. Um, often lifespan. So yeah, a lot of these things that we think of as being human limits, transhumanism would say these are not actually necessarily limits. I mean, I I had always thought of it as in suggesting that at some point we will become, for practical purposes, a different species. Yeah. So there, are, the way people slice up that that terminology can uh, can go a lot of different ways. And so particularly since I'm operating from a uh, largely a, a Christian moral kind of framework that plays into some of these things. So when we say like, what does it mean to be human? We mean we might mean two different things. A biologist might mean that you know we have a certain kind of DNA and there's certain markers. We have five fingers, five toes, things like that. Uh, but from a moral perspective, we would say, oh, it's it's about certain values. Um, and so from a moral perspective. I would say we will always want to remain human. We will always be human, uh, but our DNA may change. We may have entirely different kind of biological uh, things going on, which a biologist might say then we were uh, post-human or something like that. Okay, okay. Um, one other term we should probably put out up front because I want to get to this eventually is uh, singularity. The uh, d Is that necessarily connected to either transhumanism or Christian transhumanism? Um, so not not necessarily, but they are often talked about together. So the singularity is a hypothetical point in the future where um, where uh, our artificial intelligence, our, our digital intelligence um, 
surpasses the intelligence of, of biological humans. Um, and so people kind of put dates on this, um, you know, maybe 2045 or, or something like that, depending on the, the calculations. Um, some transhumanists are skeptical about that possibility. Um, other transhumanists are pretty certain about that, that possibility. Um, and so, and then singularitarians, people who are interested in the singularity, um, are sometimes split on whether they think that's a good or a bad thing. So those are related concepts, but they're not exactly uh, the same. I hadn't realized that that, that particular threshold where AI uh, exceeds human intelligence was, was kind of the marker. I mean, I had thought of the singularity as being a little vaguer. I mean, I, I, gather, I mean, part of the idea, right, is like things are changing faster and faster, which does seem to be the case. And at some point, they are... Ex- you know, things move so fast that be, what lies beyond that point is impossible to conceive, yes. kind of. And, and and I guess the term singularity comes from, well, well, there's uh, some connection to the idea of, a, of an event horizon with a black hole, something you kind of can't see. I don't know. You can't yeah, see no, that, but, you're 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 right. Uh, and that's the that's the metaphor of a, of the singularity is that we can't see beyond a certain point. And so, yeah, for, I think. Um, there's an implication that that um, change is happening faster and faster. It happens faster in the next five years than it did in the previous five years, and and pretty soon our window of what we can anticipate um, closes, mm-hmm. right? And so you know, hypothetically, we wake up every morning in a, a world totally unprecedented, totally unexpected. So that would be the singularity: is that we um, that we can no longer anticipate it. The, the key thing that would make that happen is that there is intelligence out there that's greater than our own. Um, and so, yeah, so that's usually where, so it, it does definitely come from that kind of vague perspective, but there is a, when people try to nail it down, they usually point at uh, the it, it explosion of artificial intelligence. Okay. So. So before we get into the melding of Christianity and transhumanism, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? You started off as a preacher's kid, right? Right. Yeah. So a PK, as they say in the business. Yes, that is that is absolutely it. So uh, preachers' kids are known um, for all kinds of things, um, including misbehavior. I might yes, know. misbehavior. I, I mean, there, there's a, as I recall growing up, there was a tendency for them to try to defy the stereotype of a PK. Right, In fact, yeah. I know of cases where they had like really kind of seriously bad outcomes. You know, like, yeah. but but uh, but but how bad was your outcome? Well, my I I actually stayed pretty close to um, uh, to the the tree. I don't know if that's the metaphor. Um, so. Uh, except you were, good, in, you were a good PK. I was a good. I was a good kid um, until transhumanism came. Until out. transhumanism. Um, yeah, I actually I did go and uh, become a rock musician, which you know most people would kind of look at that as already. Being, we're yeah. seeing signs of trouble here, right? Yeah. Unless so, it was, was it like Christian rock? Um, no, we didn't play. Uh, we didn't play Christian rock. Um, uh, although. Uh, you know, a, as a songwriter, it, you can always like slice that up and say, "Well, what you know, what's the what's really going on here?" So, but yeah, we we played um, you know colleges and uh, you know around the country. What's the and, name of the group? Uh, uh, the Redding Brothers. So, um, oh, a, so a literal brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so not too, not too. Uh, not Otis, I take it. There. Not yeah. named Otis. I always try to say that we were, uh, you know, that Uncle Otis was our inspiration, yeah. but. Uh, but yeah, so we, uh, so you know, I I did uh, rock music for a while. I did that, but yeah, I grew up as a as a preacher's kid. We, um, you know, we we were in different little churches, uh, little conservative churches all over the country. And, what, what denomination? Uh, the Churches of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, so most people would identify that as kind of a, a conservative fundamentalist uh, group. Um, and what I, but one of the huge things that was emphasized by my parents and by my, you know, Sunday school teachers and all that kind of stuff is that you study for yourself. That you know, you, the the presumption being like, um, you go, you you read the stuff, you figure it out. Uh, we anticipate that you'll come to the same conclusions we did, 
but you have to do the work. You have to do that uh, study. So I took that seriously, uh, um, and I um, I became um, you know I I studied everything from uh, scripture to theology to physics and and math and all that kind of stuff and and kind of that's that's where I started going off in a, a little bit different tangent there. Okay, and that led you fairly straightforwardly into transhumanism. Yeah, actually, so um, in in a for a lot of people an unusual way, I, I started studying um, the history of Christianity and um, and the um, what I would identify as kind of historic Christian Orthodox thinking. And as I did that, I realized some of the shortcomings of of um, American uh, fundamentalism, where that's kind of missing uh, missing some things. And I started to recognize the importance of of um, an understanding of of how the 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 physical world you know is important in Christian theology, and how the the uh, transformation of the body is important in Christian theology. And pretty soon, um, so I had what I think of as a as a very historic Christian uh, perspective myself. And when I first started to encounter um, secular transhumanists online. I recognized that, that they were trying to do within this secular context the exact same thing that Christian historic Christian orthodoxy was trying to do within the context of Christianity. Okay. Um, and was there a particular aspect of transhumanism that either drew you in or drew you into this kind of convergence of Christianity and transhumanism? Like a, yeah. a technology or a particular thinker or a philosopher? Or... Well, so... There were there were several uh, kind of overlapping things that I encountered along the way. One was uh, Frank Tipler, who wrote a book uh, in '94, or I think it came out in '94, um, called "The Physics of Immortality." Right. He, now he was a physicist, mm -hmm. and, and yes. he may still be. Is he still alive? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and um, and I I actually got to interview him recently, but he he's he developed a. Uh, he, he pursued a thought as a physicist, the question of what would it take for life to survive till the end of time? Mm -hmm. um, and what would have to be, you know, what would have to be uh, physically true? What would we have to do as a species? Um, and what would that mean about the universe if this were possible? And so he developed something called the Omega Point Theory based around just extrapolating what, what would be necessary for uh, for life to continue to survive. Now, the Omega Point theory was actually named after a Jesuit. Uh, uh, the the uh, a theory put put forth by the Jesuit priest uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin uh, back in the 1930s. Right, uh, I, I saw him on your website. So he, he looms large. I, I take it, and he um, he did uh, a lot of um, really kind of cutting-edge work, back, especially for the 1930s, in trying to understand how um, uh, science and, uh, and religion and faith could be working together and could be pointing towards the same thing. Yeah, he was uh, a paleontologist. He was a scientist as well as a, yes. a, a theologian. And, and he had this, I mean, Point Omega was this idea that, I mean, one thing... He, you know, being a paleontologist, I guess he put a lot of emphasis on evolution, and the idea was that kind of all of evolution, not just biological evolution, but subsequent technological evolution, was moving toward this thing called point omega, which involved the kind of emergence of this giant global brain thing. I mean, you read him now, you know, and he was pretty prescient in terms of of, of the general direction. Of, of social organization and, and technology, but he believed that at the culmination was this, you know, spiritually significant point omega thing. I mean, he, I, I think at the moment, the world situation is not entirely complying with his hopes, you know, because it was going to be this giant, uh, like, love blob, right? I mean, there was going to be, the planet was going to be suffused in brotherly love, Um but that that was point omega to and that has a little bit of a singularity vibe in a way yeah definitely um i think if you read him uh now you can see that you know you can you can kind of connect certain things he talked about 
um, with, like you said, like a global brain. We would talk about the internet now um, with the emergence of the singularity as this kind of like point that things are converging to. Um, and yeah, I think um, I, I think you can map out his his thought onto these kind of um, categories that we would be able to talk about now in a way that um, you know it is really astounding for someone writing in the the 1930s. And did was Tipler's notion very much like Teilhard de Chardin's notion, or he just borrowed the terminology? Yeah. So the the similarity is that uh, where. Chardin, Teilhard de Chardin focused uh, specifically on the earth and he kind of uh, didn't anticipate that uh, life would really be able to move off the planet until perhaps after uh, the, the Omega point had arrived. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, then, um, and then, you know, what would happen beyond that was, of course, unprecedented. We wouldn't know. Now, Tipler uh, recognized uh, as a physicist that we could, you know, leave the surface of the planet. Um, and, of, of course, we have left the surface of the planet. Um, and so he was looking at the, the scale of the universe as a whole. And so he's doing the same sort of thing. He's seeing this directionality to, uh, to the kind of evolution of life um, that ultimately takes place across the entire universe. Um, to bring the the entire universe into uh, an omega point and not just the surface of the planet. So where we might talk about uh, Teilhard de Chardin is looking forward to the singularity, uh, Tipler is looking forward to an even um, greater infinite singularity beyond it that contains the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And Tipler is himself a Christian, is that right? He is now. He When he first wrote, he was not. Um, but he saw he was seeing this convergence of of physical um, uh, thinking under the assumption that life continues to exist, and uh, the the theological terms of of Christianity and various religions. And as as time has gone on, he has identified more and more as uh, within the Christian tradition. Okay, and just to make sure I get it, when I I remember hearing the book, the title of the book, "The Physics of Immortality," I had always thought. He was defending the idea that, like, I could live forever in some sense. And maybe even defending the idea that this actually happens. Like, my parents, yeah, after after they died, their souls lived on or something. And he was defending that notion. What you've said so far sounds a little different. More, more, like, more like just can life continue to flourish forever. Yeah. W w was it a little of both or what? Yeah, so he sees... Uh... His, his big question is, can life as a whole continue to flourish forever? Mm -hmm. um, and he concludes that if so, if life as a whole can continue to, to flourish forever, then what happens um, over the, you know, at this omega point, at the, as, the, as life kind of converges on this ultimate direction, um, is that uh, it reaches the ability to um, understand everything in the universe, that all information available in the universe uh, becomes uh, available and, and cognizant to it, um, that everything that's possible in the universe becomes possible to it, um, and that this uh, creates a si situation where the, these living beings of the far future have the ability to resurrect uh, okay. the dead of the of the okay. distant past. So here we get to this idea. I mean, as you know, the, the person who brought you and I in touch with each other is Julio Prisco, who is a transhumanist of a not particularly Christian variety, although he's happy to, to be your, your brother in transhumanism. Yeah. Um, and he was big on this idea, which he in turn traces back to these Russian thinkers known as cosmists, mm -hmm. that, uh, that someday, yeah, in principle, you could, there, you know, the information you would need to resurrect I mean, you know, a good example is, you know, we, we, I think when I was a kid, you would have thought it was crazy that you could resurrect a dinosaur, but now that seems like not crazy. I mean, you, right. you, you can get the DNA, you can find the information, and then, you know, the rest is, is kind of details. Um, the, uh, so the idea, there, there, there was that idea. Um, and that leads me to ask you, I, well, I mean, first of all, have you, do you now think of Christian resurrection 
in these terms as something that actually will happen uh, through technical means? Yeah, so that that gets into some um, some deep theological waters. So I, I want to tread carefully uh, to to explain kind of where where things um, might connect and and um, and how we would how we would think of that from within a Christian perspective. So first of all, um, there's a common uh, perception uh, in kind of mainstream American Christianity that um, that Christians are trying to get out of the universe. Christians are trying to leave this universe behind and, you know, watch it burn or something like that. Um, but as Orthodox Christianity um, tells us, that's not actually the the end goal. You don't mean like Greek Orthodox, right? You mean like no. main, mainstream? Well, so, uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a broad, um, you know, kind of uh, line of thought that I would identify right. as, as right. kind of Orthodox right. Christianity. Right. Which would include the Greek Orthodox, Catholics, Anglicans, um, a lot of thought from within that. But, but essentially, um, the idea that historic Christianity has always focused on is that we're trying to we're we're part of a process in which God is transforming this universe, not discarding it. And so, when the resurrection happens, just like with the resurrection in the Gospels of Jesus, like it's supposed to happen in this world. In this universe, and so you know, Jesus says, "Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven." Like this is not us trying to get out of the universe; this is trying to transform the universe. Mm -hmm. So the the vision, the Christian vision of God's future is um, is that uh, God engages with humanity in this process of transforming the universe all the way up to the resurrection of the dead. Um, so that's that's already part of our universe. From within the Christian theology, um, so and, then we and, I, can... and just to interject, I think probably most biblical scholars would say that mm -hmm. what kingdom of heaven meant originally was a kingdom that would exist on earth, mm -hmm. um, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, the, the original usage. And I think scholars, and I'm not thinking, I'm thinking of kind of what you might call critical scholars, in other words, not necessarily Christian scholars, but I think would say that the notion of resurrection that leads you to be up in heaven took a while to evolve that's yeah. not that's not they would say that was not the meaning in like you know 60 uh ad or whatever right. ce yeah and and you can talk to very um uh like like nt wright who is the bishop of durham uh in the anglican church who's one of the most renowned um new testament scholars and uh and christian theologians operating uh today this is this is his Mm -hmm. uh, take down the down the middle. Like this is about God's uh, mission to transform the world, to abolish death, uh, and to renew uh, the life of all creation within this universe. So yeah, this is uh, this is absolutely um, it, what should be recognized as mainstream Christian thinking. Uh, but you know what gets publicized and put on TV sometimes is much more escapist than that. Okay, so you would see the, um, does that mean that uh, the apocalypse, we should, the Christian apocalypse, we should think of as something that happens? I mean, it is thought of as something that happens here, mm -hmm. but uh, we should think of it as something that ultimately turns this into a wonderful place? Uh, in, in, if this is the uh, entire I mean, cosmos, then yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so any given planet such as ours mm -hmm. may or may not be wonderful, but on balance, is that what you mean? Yeah, um, and the uh, the the scriptures like have this have this at the kind of outer edge of, of the the vision. Uh, Romans eight talks about um, the revelation of the the children of God, which is presumably us, leading to. Um, the liberation of the entire universe, the freedom the, where, where the cosmos itself enters the, the glory and the freedom of the children of God. So, yeah, this is that's the agenda on, on the Christian, um, you know, the edge of the Christian vision. OK, so the unfolding of technology is part of the plan, in your mm -hmm. view, and and uh, and ultimately leads to the fulfillment in some sense of prophecy. 
Yeah, so um, what w what's important to um, say, especially from within a Christian perspective, is that uh, technology is not a separate thing. Um, science is not a separate thing. These are parts of, uh, of what humans do it, that go right along with ethics, um, with particularly love, things like that, that actually enable those things to happen. So we don't, uh, we don't resurrect the dead uh, through some kind of technology that's separate and apart from our ability to understand how to put together a society that you know functions altruistically and benevolently. Mm -hmm. So those things are are very much connected, and that's that's part of an important kind of perspective that that we would have, I guess. So it's just part of the unfolding of life. I mean, much, yeah. much as I mean, when we first started cutting down trees and building houses with them, you would see that as it's part of the. Yeah, this is. And, and the Bible actually has um, a very ambitious notion of what humans are capable of. You know, if you, if you just kind of process through what the uh, Jewish people were saying uh, in the scriptures a, th a thousand or two thousand BC, like what they thought humans were capable of was vastly larger than what you would kind of imagine as, you know, and so this is where we get to this idea of overcoming human limits. They would say that there are no fundamental limits because God has created us as beings that, that are fundamentally um, equipped to transform the world and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And speaking of limits, I mean, do you, uh, does this, does technology in your mind give a new meaning to kind of the miracles in the Bible? Because this is a major source of skepticism about Christianity, um, the, the idea that uh, things that strange happen, right? Yeah, um, and, you know, uh, there are, we have to come, come at it through trying to understand um, what, it's, what it's telling us and, and then how we think about them. Part of the problem is that in the last several hundred years, um, thinkers and theologians have, uh, have tended to try to divide up their fields and so people think of, so now we have this term supernatural, which is assumed to be uh, fundamentally outside the realm of what science can investigate. But that's a new, that's a new concept, which biblical scholars like N.T. Wright and so forth would reject out of hand. And they would say, well, the way things were understood back then was not that these were outside of the ability to investigate scientifically, but just that these were big meaningful things. So you read the account of the Exodus and the parting of the Red Sea, that account doesn't say, um, and then something totally unscientific and, and happened. It says that, and then a wind blew, and the waters were parted, and that's how this, this worked. So within Christian theology, everything is open to investigation. Everything is, is up for discussion in a scientific way. Uh, sense. Of course, you do have to ask, how did the wind come to? I mean, first of all, that's a heck of a wind we're talking about. Right. <laughs> right. right. And, but, but, and, but also, but, yeah. but I mean, seriously, you have to, if you would start envisioning, well, how did the wind happen? I mean, I think that's even, you know, in other words, one reply would be, okay, well, you can push it back a step. But at some point, if you've got something that can make a, a wind blow uh, of that magnitude, that's what we mean by supernatural. Now, you can imagine a mechanical, in some sense, intervention. Um, but you see what I mean. Yeah, it doesn't, um, certainly our ability to investigate um, the, the miracle stories and so forth as, um, as scientific things does not then solve all the, the problems. Right. There's, there's a lot of things that we don't understand about, about the world, and particularly uh, Christian theology doesn't offer us... Um, necessarily concrete fixed answers exactly about how God relates to the world. It, it defines the parameters of that and what we can say and what we can't say, but it doesn't tell us, oh, well, this is what, you know, this is how this works. Um, so this would be like, you know, going off on another kind of um, tangent. If when people start talking about the simulation argument, um, which we can, we can unpack. Oh, but I'm that's always a, happy to talk about the simulation. Yeah. <laughs> But, well, I mean, from a Christian perspective, we would say, oh, well, that's what Christian theologians have been saying all along. It's that, the same, same yeah, kind of principle. Yeah, I've, I've made this point that you have people talking about the simulation and being taken kind of seriously. I mean, not... Uh, well, what I would say is they are 
not dismissed in the same way religious people are dismissed. Even if people consider it outlandish, right. uh, they they what they would call it is like a low probability hypothesis more than like, oh, you're crazy. And yet it is kind of the same thing. If there's some like programmer or some, some, some intelligence so vast that it could create what we see here as a simulation yeah. and presumably if it's still around has the option of intervening. I mean, that, that is in effect theism. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, and what people I think don't recognize, you know, cause we're using these, the terminal terminology that is new uh, with computer science, we you know we talk about simulations and so forth. But all all we're talking about is an architected uh, a thing, like a constructed algorithmic um, world. We're suggesting that that's that's maybe how the world is is built, and um, that's that's all that theism has been has been saying all along. So I guess looming here is the following kind of question or proposition. I think a lot of people would react. To the idea of Christian transhumanism by saying, wait a second, uh, when I think of transhumanists, I think of these hyper-rational technophiles who would not give the time of day to ideas that are in ancient texts that so far as we know are myths. Um, and and, and you're, you're saying it's like the other way around in some sense. I mean, is that right? You're, you're, you're saying actually technology is showing us that stuff crazier than you thought possible can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the, the the thing is that we um, we have these disconnects because we're you know uh, what we have the language that we have from two thousand years ago is different than the language we're using now. But they're pointing to the same things, and we're just getting more precise language for talking about them. But as we do, we recognize that the limits that we thought um, were kind of baked into the world. Are not necessarily baked into the world, and that's actually what um, most of of religion and theology operates on. Mm -hmm. Of course, the question would remain: Why should we accept this particular story in this particular text right. when, in all, there are a bunch of other ancient texts that have other seemingly incompatible stories? Yeah, and why would a rationalist choose any of them, or certainly you know one over the other? There's that question. Yeah, yeah and. And so, you know, this this comes down to a lot of the the same questions that you know people have wrestled with o over the years, um, and so we can you know we can accept I think uh, legitimately that um, that there will be and uh, completely possible to have um, Muslim transhumanists, Jewish transhumanists, uh, there Buddhist already are Mormon transhumanists, right? Mormon guess, transhumanists would consider yep. themselves a subset of Christian transhumanists, I guess. Yeah, and and so all those same kind of discussions can happen within you know this context. Um, and I would, I I particularly would anchor it on what does Christianity hypothesize about the world? So I see religions as as giving us a hypothesis about what will make for progress, what will make for a flourishing and thriving society and then you know, life as a whole. And Christianity says one, one very specific thing. It says that uh, love or benevolence or altruism is key to any functional uh, society. So if that, if that turns out to be true, then that looks a lot like Christianity. If it turns out to be false, then I would say Christianity is, is false under that. But you're, are you, it sounds like you're fine. Are you fine with people who are Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, whatever? Being transhumanist, uh, I mean, it sounds like it's important to you that they subscribe to this, these values of love. That would be important to you. But aside from that, are you happy with them staying in their religious traditions? The reason I ask is because, of course, according to strict Christian doctrine, they will only be eligible for salvation if, if they convert, right? Yeah, so um, the there are a couple of things there. W one of which would be, what is the basis on which we can kind of work for uh, for changing someone's mind about some some particular thing? And Christians um, are only <laughs> really allowed to do this through reason, persuasion, and um, an example. Right? That's that's our only kind of angle on this. So if I want to convince you that love is the answer, uh, 
in a very ultimate way, which Christianity says, um, uh, then I, I can only do that by by talking about it or by you know exemplifying it. So that's that's one thing. Yes. Yeah, so I'm you know absolutely we're not going to go around and try to squeeze other people out you know uh, by force or anything like that. Um, the second thing is uh, what does Christianity see? As a uh, as a future for all all of the rest of the people of the world, and the the Christian and the Jewish uh, and I think the Muslim viewpoint traces back to the call of Abraham. The call of Abraham is that God called him to bless all nations, bless all people. So ultimately, Christianity and Judaism um, are explicit in that they don't exist for themselves. It's not just about saving Christians. And us getting, you know, getting out of here, it's actually improving, blessing, um, transforming the entire world, uh, and, and that means everyone. Um, and how that works out, uh, and at what point people kind of, you know, realize certain things if they're heading down bad pathways, you know, like radical egoists, um, for example, are, are going in a very kind of antithetical direction, but what their future looks like, those are kind of open questions in Christian theology. And by the way, there are verses in the Quran that are very consistent with what what you were ascribing to Judaism and Christianity. There, I mean, there are the verses about uh, you know God made the different people so that they would come to know each other. But there are also these little stretches where where they say that you know maybe these various like non-Muslim people, like Zoroastrians and various other people that were around in their vicinity, well, kind of maybe they're eligible for salvation too. There's a kind of sporadic agnosticism on that point. Um, but, uh, so when you like look around at the world today, like what is the Christian transhumanist? I mean, are, are you processing all this through, I mean, as we tape this, we've had a very chaotic, you know, weekend for one yeah. thing, uh, where, you know, there was this, uh, I don't know when exactly this the conversation we're having will post, but, but we just went through this, uh immigration issue with the, the, the so-called Muslim ban in any event, certainly a travel ban. And, uh, and there's just a lot of divisiveness in the world and, and so on. Are you like, is there a Christian transhumanist view here that, that does this all make sense in your eyes in some sense or? Yeah, I, I, it does to me. And so, you know, I'm just speaking you know, from my personal perspective, as I've been speaking so far, um, but yeah, I, I think this is where this is where simplistic takes on things maybe um, get confused. And so, you know, having an optimistic view of the future, uh, in, in Christian in Christian thinking, having a, a hopeful view of the future doesn't mean having a simplistic view uh, of the future and how we actually get there. And in fact. You know, I think to the extent that the singularity is is a um, valid understanding of what's happening, that we're experiencing this acceleration of of technology, um, then what I would be what I would call a catastrophic optimist, which means I think we're we're moving in the right direction, but sometimes that brings about catastrophes along the way. So back a few years ago, when um, all of a sudden all the Borders bookstores basically just went away overnight. Uh, you know, that was, that was the growth of people being able to read, um, have access, access to more and more reading material. But what it resulted in is that for this particular group, uh, there was this, ca this cataclysm. And I think that happens uh, a lot. And there's a, there's a question that, that we face as a society, um, you know, as, as we're experiencing this acceleration, we're seeing... A arms race between um, the fear and and chaos that comes with that, and between the the altruism and and compassion that um, that we have to have to be able to basically kind of move us forward. And so the, there's a question right now of like which one which one will ultimately win. And I'm hopeful that love and benevolence and, and altruism will win. But I think we'll see that these things like kind of are, are neck and neck for a while and will introduce a lot of chaos into the world. So, so ultimately, in your scenario, what has to happen is uh, 
the world's peoples come together in some sense, right? They they yeah. certainly manage to live with one another, and you seem to think that that there's more than just peaceful coexistence. There's there's actual affinity. There's actual uh, love. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's the that's the context within which Christianity originally emerged. Is this this kind of um, dawning uh, global society? Where now all these different groups are are kind of clashing against each other, and Christianity um, said the w- the one path to the future, the one way that that this can work is if we increase our compassion and understand all the different races of people as being part of the same family rather than these different things. And so Christianity emerged as this first kind of um, global family system. Um, specifically to you know with that kind of thing in mind so i think we're in the same situation today if we don't if we don't take that kind of core christian realization that we are all um uh children of god as we would say in in theology um and that christians are here on behalf of the rest of the children of god then we're going to miss the the boat and Mm -hmm. Kind of blow ourselves up but but it's not that important to you right that the people evincing these values either think of themselves as Christians or give Christians a credit, right? Uh, certainly credit is not the, the issue. Um, I, I think there is, um, there is a strength and a resilience in um, an understanding um, where and why, like the, the way of thinking through these values. And, and people have spent thousands of years um, kind of formulating how these things fit together and why they fit together and why this is important. And what I would fear is that, you know, altruism and benevolence sound good up until the part where you get scared, right? And, and then you kind of, you know, tend to throw that out the window. Christianity says um, we have strong reasons to hold on to altruism and benevolence, even in the face of the greatest fear we've, we've ever known. And that's, I mean, that's the, the story of Jesus. You know, he goes into the, the, most uh, brutal experience possible and still holds on to his compassion. Mm-hmm. So you're in Tennessee, you're in, you're in uh, Nashville, and there had been some friction, you might say, in Tennessee, right? There's a famous uh, mosque case, I forget, is it Murfreesboro? Or yes. What, what, was the, what was the deal there again? Um, I believe that a, a group was trying to either expand or um, build a new mosque. Right. Uh, for their kind of expanding congregation, and uh, that ran up against, um, yeah, a lot of lot of protests, a lot of trying to uh, obstruct obstruct their work there, um, you know, in terms of building permits. And so, stuff. is this an example of what you're talking about, where the love has to prevail over the fear? Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, you know, I would say that the Christians who are doing that are missing the the point. They're missing their own story. Doing what the Christians did in, in Murphy's, what some of them yeah, did. Yeah, pro- the, protesting the, the mosque mm-hmm. and so forth. And um, at, at the same time, there have been great examples of, of Christians who counter, you know, uh, essentially counter-protesting, working to, um, to try to, you know, make these, uh, <laughs> make these Muslims feel at home and safe and protected, We've seen that in a lot of different um, places. So religion has both of those things in it, um, and and absolutely um, the the antagonistic Christian version is um, is not uh, either what I would say God wants or what uh, Christianity is about, and and it can't last. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, in terms of where your movement is, the Christian transhumanism, there is at least one actual declared Christian transhumanist pastor? Uh, yeah, and um, so there's uh, uh, Christopher Binnick is a uh, pastor in uh, Florida and uh, of, a, of a large uh, Presbyterian church there. And yeah, he's, uh, he's a declared uh, Christian transhumanist, and, um, and he's written... Uh, a number of things, and uh, even appeared on the Daily Show um, <laughs> talking about about this stuff. Uh, we've also got um, ministers uh, of various sorts uh, in our in our organization, and definitely people from um, Methodism and um, and um, 
uh, Catholicism and and all kinds of different parts of the the Christian religious spectrum. Okay, and are some of them just uh, like there? I gather there are there ministers who kind of don't declare, but make use of the ideas or something. And, and is that right? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, and you know, this is an area where a lot of people are are exploring right now and trying to trying to kind of feel their way, both from an academic perspective and kind of a in the you know in the pews perspective. Um, our group is um, a little unusual in that we're so willing to be explicit and say, okay, you know, and and we think this makes us transhumanists. And here's what that means. Mm-hmm. Now. Um do your kinds of we touched on some of your you might say political values in asking how you view these kind of mosque controversies and so on but um more broadly do your values align with the kinds of values i might associate with transhumanists like in silicon valley which is to say very non-judgmental about lifestyle so like on this on the social issues they'd be pro gay rights uh, i mean i think you know when a lot of americans think of christians they think of politically conservative uh, people, is there, I mean, or, or is there an ideology at all associated with Christian, with, with uh, Christian transhumanism? And if, but if so, what is it? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I, w- I can speak, you know, personally for myself. Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I think that, um, different, different religious groups have different sorts of ethics they require of their members. So, uh, you know, if you're a Catholic priest, you're, you're supposed to be celibate. Um, and I think that is a, uh, is a good thing, like there, that different groups have, um, have these kinds of different ethics for their own members that they um, think of as part of their specific mission. So there are different Christian groups that uh, are very affirming of, of homosexual marriage. Um, there are groups that say that's not part of what we do. Um, and I think though that diversity is good, what is a problem is when, um, certain specific Christian groups turn around and say, and our particular, uh, understanding of this ethic that we're supposed to take is now something that we are going to try to impose on the rest of the world. And I don't think we have a basis from, from within Christian thinking, Christian theology or the scriptures to do that. In fact, that's, that's against um, what I would say you know, is a very deep biblical idea of the separation of church and state, as we would describe it now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, this is... Uh, so do you, do you feel momentum building? I, I do. I think this is, um, this is definitely a conversation and a convergence of, of thought that... Um, more and more people are going to be wrestling with and uh, and dealing with, and I think that um, as they do, the the kind of positive outcome of that will be a recognition of so many resources that we have in the the Christian tradition that are that are paralleling what um, a lot of people in the secular world are starting to think about or struggle with or wrestle with. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, this has been uh, this has been a lot of fun and very interesting. Um, I got to ask you: is, is your father still preaching? Um, he is uh, he is retired. Um, he is uh, doing it kind of on a uh, uh-huh. ad hoc basis as as possible. And so, what does yeah. he th- what does he think of all this? Um, I think uh, he thinks I'm uh, you know a little uh, little outside the box. Um, there, there, but... are, there are worse outcomes. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> I've right. I've seen I've seen people get further outside the box than you've gotten. <laughs> but we I mean we have we have great conversations about um about this kind of stuff and um you know like I said I grew up being taught to to study for myself and and as you know I've always thought as long as we can uh talk about it and how we got from A to B then we're we're uh we're good. Okay. Now where can people find more about this? You've got a website, you've got a podcast. Mhm. Yeah, so the uh, ChristianTransHumanism.org is the uh, the Christian Transhumanist Association. That's where you can um, kind of join and and um, read uh, read a little bit, you know, about what we put out and what we do. Um, I also have the Christian Transhumanist Podcast, uh, which is ChristianTransHumanistPodcast.com, uh, and you can listen to interviews that I've done with people like Frank Tipler, people like Kevin Kelly. Um, 
theologians and people kind of working in science and, and technology um, about some of the intersection of these things. Um, so yeah, those are, those are great places. I, I write a lot about, uh, Christianity specifically at micahredding.com and, um, you know, about how the theology kind of works with some of this stuff. So those are some resources. Yeah. Okay. Well, I encourage people to check it out. Thanks so much for taking yeah. the time, Micah, and good luck with the movement. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, great to talk to you. Same here.